Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Donnelly. I'm a consultant paediatric intensivist based in Glasgow. Uh, thanks to Chris and the organisers for inviting me back to give a talk this year. Um, they've asked me to talk about pulmonary hypertension. Um, so throughout this talk, I'm going to talk about what pulmonary hypertension is, look at some classification systems so that we can actually think about it in terms of a more clinical context. Um, I'll touch very briefly on the pathophysiology and then we'll move on and talk about um, how we might recognize it and how we might want to approach management. So what is pulmonary hypertension? There's loads of different definitions out there um, and they vary between the pediatric data, adult data, some of them are more specific than others, but essentially the World Health Organization defined it as raised pulmonary vascular pressure, which might come from um, a result in an increase in pulmonary artery pressure or potentially in both the arterial and the venous pressures. Now, the reason I've put this diagram to the left uh, of the slide is to really hone down on the importance of recognizing that the lungs and the hearts fundamentally um, are really closely related. And when you think about conditions in pulmonary hypertension, um, it's really important that you think about all the component parts you know, you need to think about how blood enters the right side of the heart, how it gets to the right ventricle, um, the circumstances and the conditions uh, under which it's able to leave the right ventricle and get into the pulmonary arteries to get around the lungs. And then think about it coming back in the pulmonary veins, the left side of the heart and the circumstances required to allow it to leave the heart. Um, you know, it's, it's not unusual for conditions which affect the heart to have a consequential effect on the lungs and vice versa um, and pulmonary hypertension is no different so um, a few times throughout this talk we might come back to thinking about those cardiopulmonary interactions so how might we classify pulmonary hypertension because what we actually need to do is start thinking about it in terms of what does it mean as an entity what is pulmonary hypertension what might that look like so we need to think about it in some sort of system that makes it a little bit easy because it's quite a complex condition. So what about this, right? This is crazy. Um, and it just shows you how complex it is because there's a number of different classification systems that exist out there. Um, and they vary in terms of what they're trying to achieve. So for example, the Dana Point classification from 2008, that was established at the Fourth World Congress of uh, Pulmonary Hypertension. And it uses five main groups. Um, and the focus, I guess, from my perspective, it kind of looks at the various etiologies. So what conditions might lead you into group one, what conditions might lead you into group two, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So I find that quite useful because it starts me thinking about what is the underlying cause? What's the underlying condition that's causing this type of pulmonary hypertension? <clears throat> but there are other classification systems as well. So in 2011, there was a new classification, a modification of the Panama classification, and it looked pediatric specifically into 10 different classes. So in a little bit more detail, and it is a really good classification system. Um, I've deliberately not focused on that for the purposes of this talk because it would, I could probably talk for about three hours on it, um, but it is pediatric specific and it is a really good system. But then there are other, other classification systems out there as well. So um, you can see from this slide two of the tables. Um, and what that is, is it's another modification looking at pulmonary hypertension in terms of a functional classification. So how does it affect children of different ages in terms of what they can do, the limitations to physical activity, etc. So from a functional standpoint, it's actually really useful. Um, and I think both types of classification system have their place. If you want to think about, you know, how it actually affects people and what it means for the patient, then this is really good. I tend to think about classifying it in terms of underlying conditions because it allows me to think about, okay, how will I approach it? How will I treat it? Uh, what are, what's the pathophysiology in this particular circumstance? How can I move the patient forward? That's just how my mind works. Um, but all, all these systems have their place. So to that end, um, I've just highlighted specifically the DNA point classification um, because it's five with three groups. The first pulmonary arterial hypertension um, is historically, I guess, more the primary pulmonary hypertension 
So it includes things like idiopathic pulmonary hypertension and um, the hereditary forms of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, interestingly, within that group, they also include um, conditions where you have a systemic to pulmonary shunt of some description. The second group is pulmonary hypertension secondary to left heart disease. So this refers to patients that have uh, primarily some sort of obstructive lesion, whether that's a coarctation, a Schoen's complex, a core triatriatum, something like that, where you get back pressure into the pulmonary veins and it starts with pulmonary venous hypertension. And then as time goes on, you subsequently get restriction in terms of your pulmonary uh, vascular resistance indices. Group three, um, looks at pulmonary hypertension secondary to lung diseases or hypoxia. So again, this goes to show that this entity of pulmonary hypertension can be related to the heart or lungs or a combination of the two. Uh, interestingly within this, it does include things like interstitial lung disease, but also um, things like obstructive airway conditions, obstructive sleep apnea, things that over time can lead to pulmonary hypertension. So it's not just lung specifically in my head. It also includes some airway specific things as well. Group four looks at thromboembolic phenomenon and then um, group five looks at uh, multifactorial uh, etiologies, things like sarcoidosis. And um, so a much smaller proportion within the pediatric sphere. So we need to think about pathophysiology and I know a lot of people um, I'm really excited about this sort of stuff, um, but it is important. And it's important because understanding this or having a little bit of insight into this allows us to think about why we use the management strategies that we use and what particular component parts we are trying to address. And um, fundamentally, in terms of pathophysiology, we're, we're looking at excessive vasoconstriction. Now, vasoconstriction is mediated, I mean, primarily an obvious one is hypoxia, if, you need, if you're hypoxic and you need better gas exchange, you get vasoconstriction and therefore it slows the blood flow and allows more time for gas exchange. So if that's excessive, uh, an excessive response to hypoxia, that, that's um, one of the pathophysiological mechanisms. But there are also agents that cause vasoconstriction, um, things like endothelin and serotonin. And if they're expressed uh, in unusually high capacity, then uh, that also contributes to the problem. In addition to that, you might get a decrease in things that cause vasodilation, things like nitric oxide uh, and prostacycline. If they're not expressed um, to the extent that they normally would be, that will also be part of the, the mechanism of the problem. You can get extension of smooth muscle cells into arterioles, um, and that can cause compression. And you can also get um, proliferation. Um, of your endothelium into sort of plexiform lesions that can also cause obstructions or narrowing of calibers as well. Thrombosis, we've already touched on, is another potential mechanism, as is inflammation. If you get an inflammatory process and that comes with capillary leak and edema, um, all of those different components will contribute to the problem. And that's really important when we come to thinking about how we might want to manage this. So, Fundamentally, what you'll want to know is, well, who will I see? We've talked about different classifications. There's different you know, conditions that can lead to pulmonary hypertension. Um, they might have any number of pathophysiological mechanisms. But for me, what does that mean? Who will I see? Well, what you would need to think about in that circumstance is more population-based registry type studies of which there are some out there. So I've given a few examples. So one large registry study found that 82% have a, a transient process. So mostly things like um, those systemic to pulmonary shunts that can be surgically corrected. But if you exclude that, the vast majority after that have an idiopathic type picture or a hereditary picture. Um, and if you work that in terms of, uh, of incidents, sorry, it's things like association with congenital heart disease and associations with lung disease or, or airway conditions. Um, there was one particular um, registry study looking at 3,000 patients that found the incidence of an acute crisis and acute pulmonary hypertensive crisis was in the realms of 14 to 17%, most commonly in the post-op cardiac surgery cohort, and that's certainly a cohort that I would be managing quite a lot. 
Um, and it's probably the circumstances under which I would see pulmonary hypertension the most where I work. Um, and that acute pulmonary hypertensive crisis is essentially what we're talking about there is RV failure um, with signs of low systemic cardiac output in tandem with that. So how will I know that my patient's got pulmonary hypertension? You know, if a patient presents to you where you work, how will I know? Well, I guess part of it is thinking about the history. Does this patient already have a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension? Or do they have a diagnosis of a condition that you know might have that association, whether it's congenital heart disease, whether it's uh, interstitial lung disease, um, or, or whatever it might be. And um, really look into your patient's history and take the time to review previous investigations, previous consults, previous clinic letters, whether they've been seen by, by any other specialties, et cetera. There are, of course, symptoms that can be attributed to pulmonary hypertension, albeit like many things in pediatrics, they can be attributed to a whole host of um, conditions. They're not the most specific. Now, the textbooks would commonly um, divide these things into early versus late symptoms. So things like um, lethargy, um, shortness of breath, per exercise tolerance, um, would be sort of earlier symptoms. And then you can move towards later symptoms. And that tends to be more a marker of real end organ function problems. So if your RV is starting to struggle and you start to get back pressure um, from the right side and towards your body, you might get ascites, for example. So patients can present with abdominal fullness. They can also present with um, hypoxia, obviously at a very late stage, which will be cyanosis, those sorts of um, you know more significant clinically apparent symptoms. Remember with children, they can present somewhat differently as well. So you might see things like failure to thrive. You might see them being irritable. You might see them uh, sweating, particularly at rest. Now they're not that specific in isolation to pulmonary hypertension, but they're all important. So it's about having that um, differential, I guess, in your head and this thought process of it, could it be this? Or could this be an element contributing to this? So, you know, they've got a chest infection, but could they have pulmonary hypertension that is becoming more apparent in the setting of their chest infection? How else will I know other than the history? Well, obviously, you have to look towards clinical examination as part of your overall patient assessment. What can I see? What can I hear? Now, that sometimes can be a little bit tricky. Um, unless you're a cardiologist, maybe. And the reason I say that is because when you're listening to these chests, you know, the textbooks will say, well, you might hear a loud second heart sound, you might hear a systolic murmur, and there might be a parasternal heave. Uh, if you've got lines in, uh, you might see prominent A waves as early signs, or as a late sign, your murmur might become apparent as, as a uh, pulmonary regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation type murmur. Um, or you might see distended JVP, prominent B waves, or if your right side is really struggling, you'll get that edema and that ascites. Um, so there are a range of potential, potential um, signs that you might find in clinical examination, but also think about where you work. So for me, when I'm thinking about pulmonary hypertension in ICU and a post-op cardiac patients, I'm looking at their monitors. You know, I know what their setup is. I'm, I need to make sure that I've read the uh, operative note from the cardiac surgeons. What is my patient's plumbing? That's a fundamental consideration for me. And it's something that I keep hammering home um, to, to any trainees that I work with. It's really important that you know the plumbing of the patient, what has been done, what is their monitors in terms of what do they have? What lines do they have? And what are their numbers? And what's the trend in those numbers? Because they'll change over time. So for example, a pulmonary hypertensive crisis, you would expect to see desaturation. Your CVP, the number might shoot up from what it has been because the blood is not leaving the right ventricle. You get back pressure, so the pressure is higher into the right atrium. Um, if you have an LA line in, because there's not blood getting through the lungs back into the left side, that number might fall. What are your markers of cardiac output in terms of lactate, venous saturations, in terms of near infrared spectroscopy? I want to know all of those numbers and I want to know what they are when the patient comes back. I want to know what they were in theater. I want to be watching them really vigilantly to see how they change. So it's about having that real close attention to detail. But as I say, that's very ICU specific. So 
it will be slightly different depending on where you work. So take that aside, that part aside, in terms of signs and symptoms, and let's move on to how would we evaluate it, how would we investigate it. So in terms of first-line investigations, you would think about ECG, chest x-ray, and echoes. Um, really fundamental, important things. So ECG, do you see signs of right heart strain? Chest x-ray, is there, if there's no blood going into the lung fields, this should be pretty oligemic, right? Um, or is there signs of right heart enlargement? Um, an echo, uh, have they got any structural heart disease? Have they got any residual lesions? Have they had surgical correction? What does the function look like? Um, checking to see the septum position between the right and the left ventricles. Uh, what's the TR jet, the velocity across that, that tricuspid valve? And um, all of those things will paint a picture and inform you. Now, you might want to think, right, that's the cardiac side of things. Let's look at the lungs in a bit more detail. How might I want to do that? So for me, it's things like a CT of the chest or, or, or preferably a CT angio. And I'd be looking for things like, well, yes, you can look for interstitial lung disease, but I also want to look at caliber of vessels. What do the pulmonary arteries look like? And um, have they had, for example, um, removal of pulmonary artery bands. So therefore, do they have any discrete stenosis where those bands once were? Um, I would want a bronchoscopy. What does the airway look like? Do they have pulsatile compression of their airways? Do they have malacia? Um, you know, is it responsive to PEEP, not responsive to PEEP? I want to know as much information about both heart and lungs as I can. Now, it might be that you've progressed to doing a cardiac cath whereby they can directly uh, measure the pressures within the right side of the heart, and they can also do acute vasodilator testing. So what do I mean by that? Um, so I'll talk about echoes and I'll talk about acute vasodilator testing. What, what you want to see when we talk about vasodilator testing is in the cath lab, having a direct line in to measure the pressures in the right side of the heart, and then applying some faster acting agent like inhaled nitric oxide to check and see if you get a resultant drop in your pulmonary artery pressure. Um, and that's a really good test of, of trying to see if there's any sort of reversibility of that pulmonary hypertension. Um, and nitric would be where I work, probably the most common way of assessing for that reversibility. The other thing that I wanted to mention in a bit more detail was echoes. And I've deliberately shared two pictures with you here on this slide. The top left picture, um, you've got the right ventricle that has a green line in it, and it's pretty big. Um, but what you can really appreciate is that the left ventricle, the yellow cross, is pretty small. And that's because the septum between the two is bowing into that left ventricular cavity. The pressure is such within that right side that it's actually pushed the septum across. And that's a really important sign. If you get an image like this, that's that's pretty impressive. You know, you can, I can tell by looking at that that the right side of pressures are high, and I need to do something about that. And we also talked about measuring um, the tricuspid regurgitation jet, the jet across that tricuspid valve, if if you've got a regurgitation velocity. And the reason we check that is um, so that we can use this modified Bernoulli equation whereby we assess the pressure on the right side of the heart by calculating four times that TR velocity squared. And then we should add in the right atrial pressure as well. If you've got a central line in there, then you will see that number. Um, otherwise, you know, an estimate of about eight to 10 would be not unreasonable. Um, and then with that final number, you can then say, right, okay, my right side of pressure is whatever it might be, how does that compare with the invasive or non-invasive systemic pressure, i.e. do I have suprasystemic pulmonary pressures or systemic or half systemic or two-thirds systemic? So for me, if I've got a patient that's got just beneath systemic pressures in a patient who's sedated, muscle relaxed, I'd be really worried that whenever I wake them up, I'm going to run into problems. So it's a really useful investigation. But crisis ahead, this is the real worry for me where I work. What do I do when a patient has a pulmonary hypertensive crisis? And that's what we all need to think about. How would I manage that? And what do we mean by that? And um, so what I mean by that is the right ventricle is failing and it subsequently has an impact on your overall um, cardiac output. Why is that important? Because if it's not addressed, it will lead to death. How? Well, this slide kind of explains it pretty well, I think. So for whatever reason, 
whatever one of these small little bubbles around the central bubble, whether it's cardiopulmonary bypass, inflammation, hypoxia, you know, sepsis, for whatever the, the underlying mechanism might be, you get a result in increase in pulmonary vascular resistance and an increase in pulmonary artery pressure. The blood therefore has a much more difficult time leaving the right ventricle. You get reduced pulmonary blood flow because the pressure within that circuit is really high. If you don't get good blood flow around the lungs, you get VQ mismatch and you'll get a respiratory acidemia. That makes sense. If the blood can't leave the right side of the heart, that right ventricle has an increased end diastolic volume and pressure within it because more blood is accumulating there and not able to leave. Your stroke volume out of that right ventricle is reduced and as a result you get compression into the left ventricle. That ventricular interdependence is really important. It's a really important concept. Because of that you've got less blood flowing through the lungs so your um, preload into the left ventricle is reduced. Your left ventricle is less compliant because it's being squashed. Your left ventricle has less blood coming in plus it's squashed plus it's less compliant so therefore there has to be less being able to, to eject out of that left ventricle. So you get hypotension, reduced systemic outflow. Um, and as a result of that, reduced flow into your coronaries. So your risk of ischemia, low cardiac output state, and generalized metabolic acidemia and badness is high. And that is the fundamental concept of this sudden crisis. Okay, but what do I do? How do I address this pulmonary hypertension? How do I manage it? Well, you could panic. Um, it's a very reasonable thing to panic. Uh, if it's a crisis, it's an emergency, you need to act fast, so get some help. Um, but it's not always a crisis. Fundamentally, what do I do, what do I do? You need to, you need to address the underlying problem, if you can. So um, to me, there's, there's, there's three kind of EMs. Primary EM, manage the underlying problem, if that's a... Um, systemic to pulmonary connection, then surgical correction. Um, so that's primary aim. Secondary aim might be to manage symptoms. So is there something you can do that will help? Now, for example, if you have got a patient that's got a neurodisability who has got some lung disease, some pulmonary hypertension, would they benefit from um, nighttime BiPAP, for example, and we're certainly seeing that more and more, and they're getting sleep studies to manage that to the, to the best of the ability um, of the, the various teams, and that might help manage their symptoms. The third arm, that's very much managing secondary EMs, um, the third arm is managing the emergency, and that's more of a pulmonary hypertensive crisis. So what will I do for that? The key, the key part of this slide is plan. Yeah, so think about your patient population. Could one of my patients have a pulmonary hypertensive crisis? And if they were to do so, what would I do? For me, as I say, it could be a post-op cardiac surgical patient. Is it always pulmonary hypertension? No, what else could it be? So always be thinking. If this patient has a sudden um, desaturation, um, difficult to ventilate or whatever it might be, which could be pulmonary hypertension. Could it be something else? Have they got a pneumothorax? Have they got a hemothorax? Has, is there blood coming out of their drains? Or worryingly, sometimes is there not? Are they blocked? Um, can I get an urgent chest x-ray? Can I get an urgent echo? Um, do I need an ECG? Um, it's thinking about your whole differential. You know, do I need to call the cardiologist and the cardiac surgeon in in the middle of the night? Am I thinking this patient might arrest and go on to ECMO? Am I thinking that this, chest, this patient's chest needs to be explored surgically on the unit right now? Do I need to call in the theatre team? So it's about thinking, what would my plan be should something happen um, for all possibilities? Or is this a pulmonary hypertensive crisis? And how will I manage that? What's my emergency plan for that? Recognition, as I say, is the first, the first key issue. But there are a couple of uh, fundamental concepts, if you like, and I've deliberately brought back to this same diagram to think about how we can um, adjust and create the best circumstances for getting out of this crisis. So the first thing might be to think about affecting your pulmonary vascular resistance. How can I encourage blood to flow into the lungs? How can I reduce that pressure within the pulmonary circuit to encourage blood to flow into it? 
how can I make sure that there's blood even getting into the right side of the heart so that it can get to the lungs? How do I maintain and support the preload going into the right side of the heart? Assuming we have got some blood flowing, how can I maintain good ejection and good pumping action of that heart so that blood can actually move somewhere? And how do I make sure that this stiff, impaired right ventricle has the ability and the time that it needs to relax with each cardiac cycle? Because if it doesn't relax, it won't have time to fill. If it doesn't fill, it's going to be pumping with nothing in it, so nothing will be ejected. So how can I support the diastolic dysfunction of these hearts? Always think about preparation and what might the next steps be. So normally I would just chat about these rather than putting them into a slide, but I think for the purposes of a presentation that helps to see them. Reducing PVR, get the oxygen on um, through whatever mechanism you feel is best. Think about magnesium in terms of relaxing smooth muscle, Ventilation, now some will, will discuss whether that should be invasive ventilation or whether that should be non-invasive ventilation. What you absolutely don't want to do in this circumstance is um, make somebody even more anxious, more agitated, um, you know, increase their afterload and their SVR uh, and also their inherent own catecholamines, make them more tachycardic. That would be a bad idea. Particularly if it's a crisis, what you really need to do in these circumstances is take control. For me, I want to take control of everything that I can take control of, ventilation, cardiac strategy, everything. Um, inhaled nitric oxide, fantastic um, adjunct. Um, really, you know, not everybody will be responsive to it, but if it works, it works well. That's my experience. Is this patient having a pulmonary hypertensive crisis because they've all of a sudden woken up um, and there's just an increase in their pressures? Do they need to be resedated? Do they need muscle relaxant? And fundamentally, in terms of vasoconstriction, try to avoid um, acidemia. So some people would be supporters of giving things like bicarb if, if you're acidemic in these settings. Diastolic dysfunction, I've already spoken about giving the heart time to fill before it ejects to so prevent tachycardia. For me, that influences my choice of sedation. So personally, I would use uh, clonidine much more readily than I would use things like midazolam. For me personally, midazolam is a negative inotrope. Um, I, I would use it for seizures, but outside of that, I, I don't like using it at all. Protecting preload, we've talked about that a little bit earlier as well. We want to make sure that there's something coming into the right side of the heart so that it can get to the lungs. So it might be that you need to give small aliquots of volume, five mils per kilo at a time to assess the response. You don't fundamentally know necessarily where your heart is in terms of the starting curve, how stretched it is, particularly if you don't yet have an echo. Um, so you have to be really cautious with that. It might be that your heart is really distended and actually needs some inotropic support. And if you want to get blood into the right side of the heart, you need to think about, is there a venous capacitance issue? Have you got some vasodilation systemically? Um, you know, if you've got some inflammatory process that's made you vasodilated, and sometimes you benefit from having a presser. Um, diuretics, be cautious. Sometimes it will offload, help your afterload reduction but you need to maintain your preload. So I, I urge caution with those. And then facilitating ejection. If you've got a heart with poor function, particularly post bypass or something like that, um, you want to support its function and its inotropic effects without making it go too fast. So be careful about how much adrenaline, for example, you might use. And then think about afterload reduction so that there's nothing impinging the left ventricle from ejecting. So things like milrinone, which is a great drug in my opinion, because it's got inotropic properties, lucitropic properties, vasodilates. There's a lot of positive uh, mechanisms from that. But what about other drugs? You know, it's not always a crisis. So what types of drugs should we be thinking about in terms of pulmonary hypertension, you know, long-term and not long-term? Um, so there's options. In terms of um, vasoreactivity that I touched on earlier, some centers use calcium channel blockers. Um, there's not the biggest um, evidence base in, in children, I would guess, uh, from that. It's not something that we tend to reach for in Glasgow as a first line, I would say, but I'm sure it's, it's potentially center specific. Um, and I would urge a little bit of caution in terms of uh, the negative inotropy of calcium channel blockers. Phosphodiethylate inhibitors, things like sildenafil, yeah, absolutely. You know, in terms of, um, you know, optimizing your cyclic GMP availability um, to relax the smooth muscle. I think, you know, sildenafil works well. 
Um, inhaled nitric oxide, again, as I've alluded to, you know, if you're going to be a responder to it, it works relatively quickly. Doesn't seem to have much in terms of systemic um, effects, which is great. I would start at 20 parts per million, um, and you can usually wean it quite quickly. The ED50 of nitric is about 1.8 to 2.2 parts per million, depending on whether you want an improvement in PaO2 or a reduction in your pulmonary artery pressures. You kind of want both. So you can reduce it pretty quickly down to five parts per million and then reduce it slowly after that. Um, and endothelin receptor antagonists, um, that would be drugs like Bacentin. Um, again, under cardiology advice uh, is, is the circumstances under which I'd be using that. What about your surgeons? Is there anything that they can help you with? Yes, absolutely. Um, there's a couple of things that you can find out from them. You know, if you've got a post-op surgical patient, does this patient have a septostomy and atrial communication or some other connection, or do they need one? You know, they might have had a repair of their cardiac um, lesion, but actually they need a, a new one created, if you like, for safety. Reason for that is that if the pressures on the right side of the heart are high, um, if you've got a connection between your two atria, the blood can go across the right atrium to the left. So although it will be desaturated, you maintain some volume getting to the left side of the heart. So you kind of protect your cardiac output a little bit. Also from the surgeons, what operation have they done? Have they done something that might put risk towards the pulmonary arteries, i.e. removing pulmonary artery bands? Have they got discrete stenosis? Or um, if they've done a Lecomte maneuver for transposition of the great arteries, um, have they stretched the PAs by, bring, by moving them anteriorly? ACLS or ECMO, um, do we need that? We might potentially need that. If so, I would always be asking why. I mean, I'm a big supporter of ECMO, but we always have to think about what we're going on ECMO for. Is it a bridge to investigation, a bridge to intervention, or a bridge to decision making? Transplant, again, um, you know, not common. Um, I still think in paediatrics it's more likely to occur within the cystic fibrosis population than pulmonary hypertension, and it would be a heart-lung bypass as well. Um, but it depends on your underlying cause, and I don't, my understanding is that your outcomes aren't fantastic with that. So outcomes. Outcomes, um, this is my last slide, so I'll be as quick as I can. Um, variable, depending on what your underlying cause is. Um, you know, if it's a straightforward lesion that can be corrected, then your outcome would be good. Um, if you've got it as part of a multi-system disorder, then your outcome would be, you know, less good. If you look at the data, it would quote one-year survival rates globally for pulmonary hypertension um, somewhere in the region of, you know, in the 90s. Um, and then three-year survival would be sort of 85, sorry, well, 80, 80 to 90 something like that, maybe even 80 to 95. And then your five-year survival would be in the 70s, sort of low to high 70s, 72 to 78, something like that. So um, it's such a variable beast because it's such a heterogeneous disorder. So it's really difficult to put that into context. I think, you know, the, 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 the upshot of it all is that it's an evolving picture. Um, it's definitely an area under which lots of research is being undertaken in terms of medications, how they work, and our understanding as we move towards different classification systems and, and exploring etiologies in a bit more detail. I think who knows what the future holds, to be honest, but it's certainly a difficult um, condition to manage. It certainly needs a lot of thought, um, and the key to it all is thinking, planning, and keeping it multidisciplinary. So I'll leave it there. Thanks.